Welcome to the Cities at Tufts Colloquium, along with our partners Shareable from San Francisco and the Kresge Foundation. I'm Professor Julian Angerman, and together with my research assistants, Perry Scheinbaum and Caitlin McLennan, we organize Cities at Tufts as a cross-disciplinary academic initiative, which recognizes Tufts University as a leader in urban studies, urban planning, and sustainability issues. We would like to acknowledge that Tufts University's Medford campus is located on colonized Wampanoag and Massachusetts traditional territory. Today, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Teresa Williamson to be our inaugural colloquium speaker of fall 2021. Teresa is a city planner and founding executive director of Catalytic Communities, CATCOM, uh, an NGO that has worked to support Rio de Janeiro's favelas through asset-based community development since 2000. CATCOM produces Rio on Watch, an award-winning local to global favela news platform and facilitates Rio's sustainable favela network and favela community land trust program. Teresa's talk today is Rethinking the Future of Housing Worldwide, Favelas as a Sustainable Model. Teresa, a Zoom-tastic welcome to the Cities at Tufts Colloquium. As usual, microphones off and send questions either through the Q&A or chat functions. Teresa will talk for about 30 minutes and then obviously we will uh, open up for a uh, question and answer. Teresa. Thank you, Julian. Uh, thank you all um, for being here. Um, it's an honor to be the inaugural speaker. Uh, thanks to Shareable and Cities at Tufts for this opportunity. Um, so today, uh, as Julian said, I'm gonna be giving a talk on rethinking the future of housing around the world uh, based on the experiences that we have in Rio de Janeiro um, supporting favela organizers for over 20 years now. I run Catalytic Communities. It's a nonprofit organization that I founded in the year 2000 to support grassroots organizers in these communities. I'm originally from Rio, um, but I grew up in Washington, D.C., which is why I sound like this. Uh, and then I moved back to Brazil 21 years ago when uh, I started this work as part of my Ph.D. in urban planning. Um, so uh, before we get into uh, the presentation, I'm just gonna give you a quick overview. I'm gonna show a lot of slides, uh, mostly because I think it's great when people aren't familiar with a place to see images, uh, can really um, you know, paint a picture for, for you of, of what we're talking about here. Uh, I'll also show some, some, show some slides with a lot of text. Uh, and I may not go through all that text. So what I'll do is um, at the end of the presentation, I'll actually share the link, although you can see it at the bottom there uh, of this presentation. So you can take a look later if you wanna go through the slides in more detail. Uh, if you wanna catch up with me, you can email me if you wanna understand something uh, that I went over more quickly, okay? But I prefer to include all the slides um, uh, in the presentation so you can get a sense, even if I don't go through all of them in a lot of detail, okay? Uh, and so first, before we even talk about favelas and sustainability and housing, we have to understand the context that we're dealing with, right? Um, Rio's favelas are not a rarity in the world. Uh, we have informal settlements are pretty much the main way people build housing around the world. Uh, a third of people living in cities today lives in informal settlements. 85% of all housing worldwide is built, quote, illegally, according to Justin McGurk on his research. Um, and we can have, we have an option basically. We can think of these communities as an aberration as we have been thinking about them for a long time, uh, or we can actually think of them as what they are, uh, people addressing a basic need for shelter and housing um, against, you know, in, in difficult circumstances, but who are at their core trying to address a problem. So favelas really are solutions at their core. Uh, but of course, they're very challenged communities. There are many things that have to be handled, uh, but we really need to rethink our approach and how we see these communities if we're going to be able to produce better outcomes in cities around the world and build sustainable cities. So at the base of everything we do is, is an approach that's asset-based. We look at these communities as um, through an asset-based lens. So quickly, I'm going to go through a quick backdrop for those who are not familiar with Rio or Brazilian history. And I think most people, even in Rio, don't know this. Um, so Rio is actually the largest slave port in world history. Uh, we're talking about one city that received five times more enslaved Africans than the entire United States. 
uh, and slavery in Brazil lasted 60% longer than the US. And Rio's favelas are a direct uh, result of this history. Uh, the first favela was founded less than a decade after abolition. The city was the federal capital at the time. Um, and uh, the favela is named after a plant. Uh, there's nothing uh, necessarily pejorative about the word favela. It does not translate directly to slum or shantytown. These are simply communities that are developed um, you know, spontaneously and they're called favelas after that plant you see in the top right of this slide, a uh, robust, spiny, resilient bush that existed in the Northeast of Brazil uh, in an area that was, um, that where, where, where the Canudos War took place uh, which led soldiers to move to Brazil, to Rio, sorry, seeking the land they had been promised, forming the first community and naming it after uh, these plants from the hillsides where they had served battle. Um, again, this is one of the slides with a lot of text that I'm just gonna quickly go over. Uh, basically, um, there was very little rural land available. People started moving to cities. Uh, they squatted initially on these hillsides and formed the first favelas. Um, and since then, we've lived essentially a cyclical uh, process of policies of neglect and repression in these communities. Uh, often we think of neglect as an absence of policy, but in Rio we see very much that neglect is an act of policy. Uh, it's a long history to have passed without sufficient investment. Um, and neglect really is a, a choice by the authorities in these communities. We had a brief window of change, which paved, you know, painted a picture of what could be different in Brazil in the late 1980s through the early 2000s. But since then we've had regression. So again, a slide I'm not gonna go through in a lot of detail, but to summarize that in another way, you know, we've seen this cycle of neglect and repression from the authorities. But meanwhile, communities are there. They're forming, they're evolving, people are investing, they're building their homes, they're rebuilding, they're forming uh, ties and consolidating their communities. So the result is today we have about 24% of the city's population living in favelas. And most of these communities, most of the people live in these communities that are over 50 years old. And they're all over the city. This is a map that depicts just half of Rio, um, but you can see favelas are in all of the touristy areas. They're around you know, the north zone, the south zone, uh, the reds and oranges. And so uh, they're really an integral part of, of the city. Um, in the case of Rio, you can see them in the south zone. You can see them in the north zone. Um, and going back to you know, their history, um, essentially, they're a territorial manifestation of that legacy of slavery. These are communities that serve the city, they build the city, but they're not uh, seen as deserving of services themselves. So you've got a population that is there to serve and not be served. And when you look at racial maps of Rio, you see that footprint very clearly to this day. Favela communities are black and brown and wealthy areas are white. Okay, so this is the backdrop. But then remember how I shared the middle of that slide where people are building and rebuilding. So there's another part of this story, which is absolutely as critical, if not more, which is while these communities are evolving, people are investing in their homes and their communities and they create value in those communities. Um, and so what actually defines favelas today are four elements which are universal to all the favelas in Rio. Um, and none of them are necessarily uh, objectively good or bad. Um, they're just neighborhoods that develop out of a need for housing. There's no outside regulation. So what that means is there's nobody telling them how to build. That can lead to dysfunction. That can also lead to incredibly creative um, approaches to urban planning. Uh, they're built by residents uh, for themselves. Uh, people and create their own, you can see here on the right, a community building their own sewage system. People build you know, their own homes. There's incredible amount of embedded history in these communities where all the bricks, all the tiles have been laid by people and their relatives, their ancestors. And they constantly evolve based on culture, access to resources, jobs, knowledge, and the city. So a favela in the south zone will be very different circumstances from north zone. The south zone is the touristy area. The north zone is the post-industrial area. 
Um, favelas on hills will be very different from those in low-lying areas. Big favelas, small, those who are settled in the 60s versus more recently, uh, the type of leadership they have, all of these things influence the outcome. So these are incredibly diverse communities, more diverse than any formal neighborhoods would be by virtue of that lack of regulation, which again, doesn't necessarily produce dysfunction. It can also produce consolidated, vibrant communities. So um, favelas, again, summarized are affordable housing, informal, self-built, and unique. Um, and um, they're solution factories. So they start with the issue of shelter, but they go beyond that, right? So focusing quickly on shelter, I think it's really important to highlight that in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? We have shelter at the base of the pyramid. You know, we all know this, right? So water, air, shelter. Uh, but in the last few decades in urban planning um, and urban development in general, we see this con conflation of property and shelter, right? So we think of housing um, as an investment, as property, uh, not as a basic right, a basic need often. And um, this is a big problem because 20% of people, right, in any major city cannot afford market rate housing. Uh, and so it's not a coincidence that 22, 24% of people in Rio live in informal settlements in favelas. They're a natural uh, response to the lack of public or private sector opportunities for shelter. People create their own housing um, and that's what informal settlements are. And they're no different. This problem is not a developing world problem. It is global, right? Los Angeles has 70,000 people living on the streets in tent cities. So, um, you know, as an urban planner, I've come to appreciate a host of qualities favelas have uh, organically, to, to, for the most part, uh, that we try to, in, you know, develop in our cities. Um, and often it's hard to retrofit these qualities if they weren't established in the first place. So affording, in Rio's case, affordable housing in central areas, the architecture is responsive. People had developed their homes um, in response to their needs. So this street that you see here on the bottom right, this is in Muzama. <clears throat> Everything you see in that picture was built by residents. Um, so when somebody builds their house, right, they initially they would have bought just land or a small shack. They'll uh, build a room. They'll improve the quality of that over time. They need another uh, room for their child is born. They add another room. Uh, their child grows up. They might add a floor for them to live with their family. They become an employee. They might move upstairs and start, start a shop below. Uh, they need leisure space, they might open a terrace on the roof, they need extra income, they might add a floor and rent it out. Um, these are incredibly versatile communities where people create architecture around their needs. Uh, they're pedestrian oriented, right? They're in Rio's case, they're typically near, they, at least they were founded near employment. This is a huge issue uh, that evictions, you know, um, uh, you know, causes people are moved far from their employment, but typically favelas form around employment um, and so on. So there are a number of qualities we've documented, sociocultural assets in these communities, urbanistic and economic qualities. Um, this is a study that came out at the end of Brazil's economic boom period a few years ago. So it's not, act, it's not current but it was really um, telling because during that boom period, the average wage in favelas increased 55% uh, in the previous 10 years, which was significantly more than the national average of 38%. Um, and 81% you know, of residents like their communities, 66% wouldn't like leave their communities, 62% were proud to live there. And these are statistics that paint a very different picture from the popular misconceptions of these communities, which lead unfortunately to those counterproductive policies I mentioned earlier. Um, this is a, um, a, you know, a simple uh, activity we did a few years ago. Uh, we, when Rio was prior to hosting the Rio Olympics, uh, the city was building the Athletes Village, which is this development you see on the right. They were able to get it certified at the time as the first lead, lead neighborhood development initiative in Latin America. Um, we thought it would be interesting to compare that to <clears throat> on the lead standards to a nearby favela uh, with the help of one of the architects of LEAD-ND. 
Uh, and we actually found that the favela had higher indicators on uh, neighborhood pattern and design <clears throat> and location and linkages. So this is just the kind of thing, just to kind of help flesh out this idea that favelas are not inherently a problem, yeah? <clears throat> so to go further down that, um, that uh, uh, line, let's um, look at specific examples. So this is a community called Vale Encantado. It's located in the Chijuca forest um, above Rio. It's a community where you see Otavio here on the bottom left, building a biodigester for the community sewage system. He's the president of the co-op in the community. This is a neighborhood that's trying to become basically a laboratory for sustainability uh, among favelas. They were recognized in this article in the Atlantic a few years ago. Um, they're almost, they're about to finish the first full biosystem for sewage of a favela in Rio. It's a small favela, it's about 40 families, um, but it's the idea is to create a prototype for other communities. Uh, this is an example of in the Vigigal, which is a favela that if any of you have been to a favela in Rio, this may well be the favela you visited. Uh, it's in the South Zone. Um, it's, it's next to Leblon, né? Um, a famous uh, beachside neighborhood. Uh, they actually, residents took out 14 tons of trash by a hand from this site where the city had demolished buildings, left the debris. It had accumulated trash over years and uh, they were concerned about landslides and other things. And they've turned it into this incredible garden oasis. Of course, when it comes to culture, then pe people are typically more aware of the assets of favelas, um, whether it's you know capoeira, whether it's samba, whether it's carnival. Um, Rio's popular culture is basically rooted in the favelas, um, maintained or strengthened or developed in the favelas. Um, more images along those lines. And if you, again, another slide with a lot of text, um, just to, to provide information, you can look at it later. But essentially what, what I'm arguing here is that it's important to recognize that formal and informal um, environments uh, in cities are not, um, they're, they're two, they represent two different ways of life. Uh, an informal uh, community is not simply lacking in formality. It's not lacking in formal instruments. It's not just about what it doesn't have. It's not just about not having land titles or the businesses not being formal or the electric grid not being formal. Um, there's a lot more to that. So uh, for example, in the formal city, you have limited complexity because these neighborhoods are regulated. In the informal city, you have in growing complexity, which can be an asset in cities. It can help build resilience. Um, you have uh, more financial monetized, right? The formal city is more monetized. You have to pay to get things done. In the informal city, many services are demonetized. A lot of support is provided through mutual aid, through self-build. Um, there's a logic of privacy in the formal city and of proximity in the informal city. All of these things are important to recognize because when government comes in to formalize informal settlements, they may be unraveling qualities that were developed there. They may be unraveling the social fabric. So it's very important that any planning that happens in these communities is done very carefully. You know, it's, it's an ecosystem like any other uh, of people, right? Any neighborhood, and you have to respect the way people have come to develop their community. Um, and on this point of complexity, I just wanna show a slide here uh, that looks very uh, confusing if, if you're not intimate um, with the science, which I'm not. Um, but basically I borrowed this from David Krakauer of the Santa Fe Institute because I thought it was a nice depiction of what happens as, as basically what it shows is as you grow the randomness in a system, um, any system, you get more complexity to a point, and that complexity can breed resilient systems like an ecosystem, um, for example, right? The more complexity, the more uh, resilient an ecosystem is. So he applied the same logic to art, just to give a different uh, take and, and, and facilitate our understanding. And then I just like to, just as a way to uh, encourage discussion and reflection, apply the same logic to human environments, to urban environments. So the simplest complexity um, and, and randomness, right, uh, would be 
like a cul-de-sac neighborhood. And the most would be a sort of dysfunctional urban environment where things can't move and, and, and so on. But somewhere in between, there's a sweet spot. And I would actually argue that um, some informal settlements that have been able to consolidate uh, to a point and, and reach a healthy, um, a, a healthy level of exchange and some mutual aid and support, development, access to services, could be at that sweet spot. They provide incredibly, you know, um, uh, you know, vibrant um, uh, environments for people to live, which is why many people in favelas now don't want to leave their communities uh, if they get the opportunity. They want to stay in their communities and see them improve. So here I'm gonna show just a few different pictures. I show different communities, different favelas in Rio at different levels in their development uh, and in, with different levels of services, different scales. Um, I'm happy to go back to any of these later if you have any questions about them. Uh, lack of investment where residents have to address their needs themselves, right? The, the incredibly um, uh, creative environment that's created and the, the ability that people have to sort of take over their street and use their street as a pedestrian zone primarily, right? And of course, culture. <laughs> this is an image of um, uh, from Providencia, which is the first favela. It was originally Favela Hill. I mentioned at the beginning, it's called Favela Hill. It was the founding favela of the term. Uh, today, it's known as Providencia. Uh, it's still a favela, right? It hasn't received titles fully and uh, been integrated fully in terms of uh, upgrading of, of services. Um, a few years ago, about a decade ago, the city declared they were going to evict a chunk of you know, the community, a section of the community, and the local photographer went ahead and took photographs of the people who were threatened with eviction and plastered them on the sides of their homes as part of a campaign to stop the evictions, and it was successful. Um, so what we found essentially is that the favelas that where residents take advantage of the qualities of informality, realizing their creative improvements because they can, um, but also fighting for access to services, they seem to make the greatest inroads over time. So both, so not sitting back and waiting for the government, but also um, not uh, simply uh, developing informally. So the combination of developing informally, but also constantly um, seeking government investment. So I'm quickly going to talk about our organization, Catalytic Communities, so you get a picture of our project, so you can ask questions about these as well. Um, we've been around 21 years. We just turned 21 this week. Um, and essentially, everything we do is our basic model is very simple. We identify people in favelas who are doing incredible work, who are working on behalf of their communities, and we find out what we can do to help. It's very simple. You don't need to have a nonprofit to do that. Um, but we have created an organization that basically creates a whole resource network of um, programs and volunteers uh, and, and, uh, and access to resources and networks to support those local organizers. So we have four main programs at the moment, but in our early year, and I'll tell you about those in a second, but in our early years, um, our focus really was about connecting grassroots organizers to each other through our community center, um, and also to through technology, uh, posting their local solutions in a database online before social media. So we had a community solutions database, um, which was in Portuguese, English, and Spanish at the time, sharing these grassroots solutions. So all of our work has always been around supporting these grassroots solutions in favelas. But then what happened was in the pre-Olympic period, and this is where we became known, um, we started, we realized that the communities we had been supporting for a decade from 2000 to 2010 uh, were facing eviction and they were being threatened directly by the government. And a lot of that was based on misunderstandings of what these communities are. And this broad assumption that they have no qualities, they have no value, uh, that they're better off if they're removed, they're better off if they're relocated to public housing, which is not true typically in Rio anymore because of the quality uh, favelas have attained and also the lack of quality of the public housing and the distance from people's needs um, being met. 
and so on. So we realized that it was important to do work on the narrative of favelas. And we really focused on that for about six years, working with the international media, working with community journalists, which is a huge movement in Rio, um, and reporting. And then now we've entered a phase developing models. So our focus now is really about how to, uh, how to actually create sustainable favelas, how to develop these communities sustainably. Um, so I'll talk about the, th the four programs we have uh, in them now. <laughs> Here we go. So um, first is Rion Watch, which I just alluded to, right? That was our reporting work starting in 2010, which is really about dealing with the narrative of these communities because it's so counterproductive that it keeps them from developing in the first place. Uh, it keeps pushing them back because it facilitates uh, uh, counterproductive government programs and it um, makes people, it stigmatizes people, it makes it hard for them to uh, be served as full citizens, be seen as full citizens. The second is the Sustainable Favela Network. And this I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute um, because the focus of course today is on the sustainable elements of favelas. And this is essentially a broad network of hundreds of grassroots leaders across favelas that are working to develop their communities sustainably. Um, and the third program is the Favela Community Land Trust Project. I know some of you at Tufts are familiar with community land trusts. Of course, Dudley Street is a global example that you guys have right there. Um, and uh, we've basically been introducing this model in Brazil as an alternative to either keeping favelas, you know, um, untitled or titling them through individual titles because favela community land trusts can protect them against both eviction and gentrification while preserving the assets that we've been talking about all along. Um, and then finally, last year, we launched the favela COVID-19 and Favelas Unified Dashboard, which is a crowdfunded data platform, uh, sorry, a crowdsourced data platform where uh, community groups collect data on COVID in their communities. And together with other data sources, we've, we've been able to access, we've compiled the most complete uh, picture of the impact of COVID across the favelas. Uh, so you can see here from this part on the right that these programs, they work in sort of a cycle. Uh, so catalytic communities, our work began with grassroots organizing support, but we realized when the Olympics came and evictions were happening, that if we didn't deal with the narrative of these communities, you can only do so much through organizing. It was important to do both. So we sort of backtracked a bit, started Rio One Watch, and then now we have a cycle that we believe as we move forward in all of these elements, we're going to be able to really firm and maintain these communities and help develop these communities um, through their own, uh, their own priorities, right? Um, another slide with lots of text, uh, but I think this one's really important. Um, so we operate on an asset-based community development framework. Uh, and so what that means is rather than like typical government programs, right, or even large NGOs sometimes focusing on a community's deficiencies, we focus on their assets. Rather than thinking, oh, we're gonna solve problems and we're gonna bring in technical solutions, we identify opportunities based on their assets. And then from those, we springboard forward to thinking about solutions. Um, we don't see them as communities deserving of charity or a favor, we see them as communities that um, deserve investment and have rights. Uh, you know, we're not outside experts bringing in our solutions. Uh, we see ourselves as technical allies engaged in mutual exchange and so on. So you can kind of go down this list and see that it's very different the way we approach uh, organizing and supporting grassroots communities and the way they're typically treated by the government, which is really counterproductive, especially in communities that have so much to offer. So I'm going to talk now, finally, before we conclude, I'm going to um, highlight the Sustainable Favela Network part of our work. Uh, the Sustainable Favela Network started, it was actually seeded in 2012 when um, Rio hosted the Rio Plus 20 United Nations Conference on the Environment. Uh, and we saw in that an opportunity to talk about some of the assets of favelas. And so we put out a call. This is how we do a lot of our work. We put out a call to our community network. You know, is anybody interested in doing, um, talking about their, their community from a sustainability perspective, your solutions, your challenges? And we got 50 responses from 50 community leaders. 
We identified eight that were very diverse across the city. We went out and filmed whatever it was they wanted to share. And then we patched together, created um, a, a film based on those stories. Uh, and I highly recommend it. I think it's, it's a wonderful film. Um, I'm very proud of this project. Um, and that's gonna be almost a decade ago. But the actual network didn't begin until uh, 2017 because we were so focused on the narrative and our work with media and Rio One Watch in the pre-Olympic buildup. And the Olympics were in 2016. So in 2017, uh, we mapped this network. We put out a call again, and we got over hundred community groups that shared where they have, what kind of work they're doing on socio-environmental issues across Rio. Uh, and reported on this. You can see that most of the projects were in this bottom right image you can uh, chart. You can see that most of the projects were fairly new, right? So they hadn't, uh, we weren't particularly established. Um, so in the next year after that, we, we did a whole bunch of exchanges between some of the more established projects. And then we launched the network at the end of 2018. And here are some of the projects and organizations that do this sort of environmental work in Rio, whether it's um, stream cleaning, whether it's uh, working with you know, um, uh, income generation through uh, adaptive and creative reuse of materials. Uh, there are recycling cooperatives. Uh, this is a music program that uses reclaimed materials to create the instruments. Um, you have solar panels in some favelas. Uh, here's another and another. Uh, you have this is a water society. It's a favela where people uh, organize the water from the from a source at the top of the community across uh, residents. Uh, you have community gardening programs of all sorts. Uh, also, just individuals who love to garden. Uh, this is a green roof project, which um, is really incredible. The the community leader who set this up, um, they've been able to record. Uh, temperature difference in his house of 15 degrees Celsius cooler in midsummer to neighboring homes. So we're trying to expand this green roof project. This is a video we did earlier this year about this project that you guys can check out um, when I share the presentation later. Again, different kinds of gardening projects. This is a project in another favela uh, where grassroots organizer put set up a solar power um, uh, uh, system to um, irrigate his, his garden. Uh, then there's tons of environmental education projects across favelas uh, that do incredible work. Um, and uh, we've been reporting on this for the last couple of years. Uh, these are, oh, these are the events that we held in 2019. We had about 80 to 100 people at each of these. They were these massive exchanges where we worked with, we basically grassroots organizers from different favelas would all go to one community and learn all about what they were doing there. And they would do trainings and sometimes they would do cleanups. Um, this is at one of those events, one of the capacity building circles. This is another event um, at a recycling facility and graffiti museum. Um, this is a river monitoring uh, project that, that the, the graffiti artist uh, who runs the Recycling and Graffiti and Green Museum was doing. Uh, this was at our annual event at the end of 2019, which, um, oh, it's so sad now because we haven't had in-person events for so long, but we miss it. But we've been doing everything online since then. This was our last in-person event of the Sustainable Favela Network in late 2019. Um, now, then just before we finish up and go to questions, just want to quickly say the pandemic um, has exacerbated all of those issues we talked about earlier. Favelas are incredibly at risk, um, both because of factors like uh, in inadequate water um, and sanitation, people not being able to just, you know, take time off from work or work from home um, to, to survive, uh, but also things that normally are qualities of favelas like intergenerational living or a strong social fabric where everyone, you know, talks, these are things that actually became a risk uh, factor, but communities have responded. So um, really, it's been incredible to watch all of those groups I just mentioned, the pandemic hit, they shifted gears, and they've been entirely focused on supporting their neighbors through this difficult time. Um, 
This is a project, uh, for example, that did agroforestry in a favela before the pandemic, and then they switch gears completely during the pandemic, and they've been trying, they've been getting agroecological produce to residents to support them to fight food insecurity. Uh, this is another project before the pandemic, they were focused, bas they basically had this huge space and they did everything they could to support uh, community residents, whether it was tutoring or um, uh, martial arts or massage or um, film screening, anything you can think of. And during the pandemic, they just totally switched into a distribution center for uh, goods to help people. Um, so during the pandemic, everything went online, including the Sustainable Favela Network, which has held a number of public teach-ins, live events on the pandemic. Um, this is a video you guys can check out later if you want. Summarizes all of those events last year. It's got English subtitles. Oop, sorry, I'm not trying to watch show it. I'm just trying to flip through. And then finally, um, just to conclude, you know, uh, before we conclude, uh, there are 26 museums and favelas in Rio and memory projects. If you think about a community or think about informal settlements or what we, you know, in English, unfortunately, is often translated as slums despite their longevity or despite their own experiences, right? Think about, that's the antithesis of what we think about, right? We think of slums as precarious communities that everyone wants to get out of. Now, if they're setting up museums and they're working to preserve their history, then that doesn't sound like something temporary, does it? And so it's really important. It's another kind of demonstration that these communities are here to stay and that it's important to include them in our development. And so to conclude, um, you know, in the pre-Olympic period, 80,000 people were evicted from their homes across Rio's favelas. Um, many of these were consolidated communities. Um, and we really need to think about these, this differently. You know, we have these double standards, uh, you know, as urban planners, right? There are all these things that become in vogue, tactical urbanism, hacker spaces, you know, risky playgrounds. Many of these are just uh, are, are done in favelas and informal settlements um, uh, organically. They are part of how these communities develop. And if you really think about it, most UNESCO World Heritage Sites uh, were established informally. And when you look up why they're seen as World Heritage Sites, you get descriptions like their vernacular urban fabric adapted to the hillsides or their improvised urban design and unique architecture. Um, so we really need to uh, drop those double standards and think differently. Uh, and so I'm hope that that's what I brought today, a different perspective. Um, Brody Fisher at the University of Chicago, you know, she points out that this is all recent, right? <laughs> Just think about a few hundred years ago, right? Before industrialization, that's how cities develop. They developed the way we could, whatever we could do with our own hands at our scale. And there weren't that many rules for how to do it. Um, and we use the materials around us and so on. So that's really what informal settlements are. They're just the way people build cities uh, organically. And so the question is, what if Rio embraced the unique heritage of these communities and recognized their contributions in ways that supported their development um, by, by, by honoring resident knowledge and history? And what if we invested in decentralized urban planning where communities control their destiny and allies support that vision? And then finally, we have a, the UN predicts a third of humanity will live in urban informal settlements by 2050. So we need a new approach. You know, what if Rio set that example? Uh, we have a lot of things coming up with our organization. Um, I'd rather hear questions from you guys, so I'll skip through. I'll mention that we have a digest that we send out every few weeks that compiles all the news on Rio's favelas in English. It's a great resource. We put a lot of work into it. Please sign up because it's free and available. Uh, we also take interns. So if you're interested in that, we welcome you. So looking forward to questions now. Well, I am buzzing with uh, thoughts and ideas. What a great way to kick off the uh, fall colloquium series. Teresa, thank you. And the, uh, the chat is buzzing with questions. I'm hoping we can get through them. I'm going to try and go through them in order, although there's one that I particularly want to get to. Um, so first question, um, fascinating presentation. Are there cities and communities in the US that operate with this kind of amazing social capital and autonomy? 
Um, well, I'm not familiar personally with the informal settlements in the US. I do know that um, they exist. Uh, I've been told in California, there's some areas where they are, so I don't know. Um, I mean, I think there are different circumstances, you know, uh, they're different, um, you know, uh, the US is a highly regulated country. Everything here is very different um, in those terms. And uh, I've actually heard planners and, and um, uh, in the global South say that maybe we should be thinking about cities in two different approaches and that uh, there should be, instead of trying to impose a a, a hyper-regulated structure in, in those countries, maybe there needs to be space. And I would say that probably some, you know, I don't know, I, it, I feel very um, personally committed to, you know, people, people de determining their own, um, their own priorities. And I think, uh, so, so I don't, I wouldn't say that what's happening is better or worse than somewhere else, or, or certainly our problems in Brazil are much more severe in terms of survival on average um, than they are in the US. So, you know, I, it's hard to say that it's better uh, what the outcomes there. I don't know if I'm fully addressing the question. Um, no, that's, I think that's great, Teresa. Um, question from Josh, how do the programs that CATCOM offers engage with the insurgent urban movements such as MTST in Rio? How do the formal legal organizations like CATCOM navigate the legal gray zone, e.g. illegal land occupations to further their goals and vice versa? Mm -hmm. That's a lot of great questions. Great question. Yeah, yeah, these are great questions. Um, so, well, we, we, we work um, with housing movement, like movements that are dealing with, so the MTST um, is the, the, um, the homeless, a, a, a federal, a national level organization that supports people living in, in situation of homelessness um, and they help do occupations. Um, and there are a number of groups like that. We've been involved a lot with them within the Favela Community Land Trust Project, which I didn't mention as much. Um, and, you know, in terms of addressing the, the gray zone um, of formal and formal, um, it's culturally very different. I mean, we use the formal structure as much as we have to, but we actually very much work as informally as possible um, in our own activities. And we're inspired by favelas in terms of how we organize as an organization. So for example, we do as much as we can with as few resources as possible. Uh, we try to develop our projects in a way that we can, that, that's cheap or free so that we can share the strategies that we use as an organization with our community partners. Um, and so we're not using sort of expensive technologies or uh, uh, depending on, um, uh, expensive labor for anything that we do. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, so that, so that's, it's an interesting question. I'm trying to think about all the different frame, you know, frames that I could push, you know, think that through. Um, if you have a specific element that you want to know about, um, let me know, because that might help me focus a bit more. Great. Well, I think Josh can follow up with you, um, uh, in due course, Teresa. Uh, Valeria asks, um, as future planners and policy makers, how can we make sure not to over-regulate in order to sustain creative hotbeds without communities having been forced into creativity due to neglect? Essentially, how do we sustain, create that sweet spot you mentioned? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, uh, so, I have a friend from graduate school who did his research on one of the part of the Brooklyn waterfront where there was a skate park back in the, the 90s that was massively revitalized and developed and became more of a private zone. I don't remember the exact site. Um, I remember talking a lot with him because this is a US case where uh, basically a public site was taken over informally. It was incredibly vibrant. All sorts of folks used it. Um, people came from far away to see it, to be there. Um, and instead of seeing that and the qualities that have been created there and working to um, embrace that, the government, you know, destroyed it. They didn't see that. And so I think that happens everywhere. I think it's, it's a problem for cities because what we want is cities that are inclusive, vibrant, diverse, um, you know, and, and so I, I think in a place that's very regulated, one way to do that is to create 
uh, through regulation, create spaces of deregulation or lack of regulation, create spaces for to allow those to just allow those things to happen. And then as planners, my view is that we should be observing those processes and seeing how we can uh, integrate the learning that happens, the organic planning that happens that that often will will give us ideas for how to make our cities even better. Um, so I think that's one one thing that can happen. Um, but if there are other questions, I guess I'll continue. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, the, the questions are coming thick and fast. Okay. Uh, uh, another question from Valeria, and she apologizes for asking too, but I think this is a really an interesting question that a lot of people are going to want to hear your response to. How do favelas deal with security issues? I've often heard of favelas as areas that can be dominated by gang violence. Thus, how do these communities work towards some kind of policing that may be less scary and more in tune with wanting to keep communities safe instead? Um, yeah, so we had a period in the, um, you know, so uh, it's very complicated because um, a lot, the government neglect, you know, really, really over, over generations facilitated the establishment of these, of these problems, right? Um, and then instead of, of addressing that neglect, um, which is what produced uh, a lot of the crime, um, we continue, you know, addressing the, the final result and not doing it and doing it harmfully. For example, last year, the, the Brazilian Supreme Court actually passed, um, uh, passed uh, or passed, um, uh, voted in favor of, of a landmark uh, prohibition on police operations in favelas during the pandemic because they were creating, they were exacerbating the pandemic when the police would come in, there would be chaos, um, community organizations that were providing relief couldn't do that, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we actually saw a huge decline in, in um, mortality in these communities because a lot of it is produced by these sorts of, uh, by police um, and not by gangs. Uh, I'm not defending gangs, uh, but we actually have a, a bigger problem in Rio, which is the militias now than the gangs. So in the last decade, these vigilante off-duty police mafias, which we locally just call militias, they've taken over many, many favelas and they, they now control more of the city than drug traffickers. So the gangs are the police whether it's official, you know, officially or extra officially. So um, it's, it's hard and, and really what needs to be done is investment in these communities. And, uh, but on their terms, on their terms, not because what we found also is when the government comes in with their programs and it's not through community controlled and community informed, not just informed, but controlled um, development, it often ends up backfiring too. Um, and that's created a really sad situation where we have communities that don't want investment sometimes, don't want titles. We've had communities where people fight against titling because they don't want gentrification and they say that that's what's going to happen, right? Um, there are communities that are fighting against uh, investment in infrastructure because they, they think it's going to be the wrong kind of infrastructure or it's going to cause evictions or, you know, in the North Zone, we have Favela Valemão where the cable cars were built and uh, people were removed from their homes in that period before the Olympics, this whole system of cable cars and, you know, the, the, it was all over the media, all over the world. Well, when the, after the Olympics happened, shortly after, they were all shut down. There are these white elephants floating above everyone's heads now for the last five years. And the stations have been turned into police stations. Mm -hmm. So where people had houses are now poli the police occupy them and they keep an eye on the whole community. So, um, you know, we, people don't trust the government. And uh, anyway, it's very complex. Well, thanks for that. Yeah, that's, that's a really useful answer. Uh, Scott asks, um, well, he says, thank you. Beautiful talk and ideas. So much to learn as we struggle to solve the housing crisis in the US. I saw permaculture mentioned in one of the slides. Has there been active perm an active permaculture movement in the favelas? Um, a little bit, yes. Um, actually, one of the movements we see the most among the, so the, the environmental uh, uh, infrastructure um, movement within favelas is gardening in general. So uh, community gardens, 
um, agroforestry, permaculture, uh, green roofs, uh, different forms, um, partly because I think it's so accessible and, and, and it, it, you know, it helps achieve greater food sovereignty. It's a very tangible, accessible thing that people can do in their lives right there where they live with fairly low resources. So we've seen a bit of that. And there are a couple of organizations that are sort of the front, forefront of that. So if any of you are interested, you know, just um, you can email me at the email I just shared and tell me, um, tell me what, you know, what you're interested in and I can share those links with you. Great. So our uh, community watch party, the Brown House Classroom has asked, has the network made efforts to influence formal infrastructure systems to support favela needs and regional connectivity like transportation, digital resources, sewerage, etc.? Uh, any insights about the power for institutional change? Yeah, so um, the Sustainable Favela Network has been on sort of a course of development, which I would say is sort of inspired by and similar to other uh, grassroots movements that have been successful within communities where there's more of a focus internally first to build itself and create trust among members, create a common vision before kind of going outward facing, before, before necessarily working with government or so on. And that's really important. I think the Transition Towns movement has, I think, at their, on their list of how to approach uh, transitioning to, you know, uh, green uh, community, they have, I think it's eighth or ninth or tenth on the, the order where they actually engage with the authorities. Um, and so it's been a similar process with us because basically uh, there needs to be this trust. So the first few years I described with the networking, the solution sharing. Last year, um, the, the network began engaging more with the authorities uh, the, towards the end of the year. And any of you are interested, please, I can send you the link. It's really, it's an amazing letter. Uh, the network put together a commitment letter uh, they sent to all the candidates for city council and mayor with something like 80 different proposals uh, for all these different elements that are worked on by the network, which includes uh, food sovereignty. So it's community gardens, um, solar energy, uh, environmental education, income generation, um, uh, memory and culture, solid waste and so on, water, sewage. So there, there are all these elements that they put in the proposal and um, 94 candidates signed the proposal and then they, put together a debate with the mayoral candidates um, and eight mayoral candidates came and it was on Zoom. So there's been some engagement with the authorities um, around, around uh, implementing some of these ideas. Not many, not many of those folks were elected. <laughs> so this year there's been another process to try to um, share more, um, but I think that's going to be growing going forward, right? That focus on influencing. The main thing is that, uh, yes, there have been movements towards that, but it has been, um, like I said, uh, it's a, it's a upward battle with, with getting government. So the network works along these two lines. One is creating solutions on the ground and not waiting for the authorities. But all, but meanwhile, there's now a participatory front policy front within the network that's working on how to engage the authorities with these issues. Just on that participatory, I'm thinking of participatory budgeting. Mm. Is is that involved at all with the favelas? Because you know, if enough people, um, if Rio had a participatory budget process, then enough people came from the favelas to vote. Surely they could tap into. Um, municipal resources. That would be wonderful. <laughs> we have not had participatory budgeting in Rio. Um, it, it was created in a southern city in Brazil a few decades ago. Well, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it expanded throughout Brazil. There's other parts of the world who have implemented it, and it's an incredible model. Um, basically, you take the discretionary budget of a city and then divide it up by neighborhoods and based on need and population, they determine what they want to use that money for in, in their within their local area, and it's it's a wonderful wonderful uh, model. Um, but we've never had it in Rio. There's been a few people trying to pressure for it, but we've never made any progress. Right. Final question to Danielle: uh, Are community leaders and community members in favelas thinking about climate change? 
Yes, um, it very much impacts these communities. The ones on, on hillsides, uh, when it rains, you can get landslides. And the ones in the low-lying areas, when it rains, you can get flooding. And um, all favelas are either in one or the other because favelas tend to occupy the, uh, the, the, the land that no one else is using in the city. Um, and, and public land, uh, or, and which in the case of the hillsides were, were originally occupied for, for you know, by favelas. So people are talking about it. And actually the Sustainable Favela Network just decided that we're gonna make climate justice the focus for the next year, year and a half. Um, and not necessarily, not just talking about it, but implementing it. I mean, really what the Sustainable Favela Network does is implement climate justice. And so thinking about our programs in terms of, of implementing. In, um, so yes, we talk about it, folks, um, grassroots organizers uh, worry about it, but it's not something that is, uh, you know, people are talking about food sovereignty. They're talking about, you know, because they need food, they, food insecurity and therefore food sovereignty. They're talking about energy justice and the need for access to energy. They're talking about access to clean sewage, et cetera. And so, but those things are an implementation, right? When people act, they are, and so there's there's growing recognition of these relationships. But yeah, climate is not at the forefront of people's thoughts yet because they're dealing with daily daily responses to, to daily needs. Yeah. Well, Teresa, that's a, a great point to finish. If uh, you have set the standard for this uh, this fall, if, if if they get any better than this, I don't know if I'll be able to come uh -huh. seriously. Like, fantastic and um, I am sure you're going to get a lot of emails from our students uh, I wouldn't be surprised if a few don't ask you about internships as well it was fantastic mm -hmm. can we give a, a UEP round of applause to Teresa please thank Thanks, you guys you're Great. wonderful and wonderful next, questions amazing fantastic questions yeah next week we have dr pascal joasad marcelli of uh, san diego state who will be talking about contested geographies of food ethnicities and gentrification thank you and thank you again teresa thank you thank bye you. bye bye mm -hmm.